Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Kawazi Conference Call. My name is Matt, and I will be your conference coordinator for today. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. We will be facilitating a question and answer session towards the end of this conference. If at any time during the call you require assistance, please press a star followed by a zero, and the coordinator will be happy to assist you. I would now like to turn the presentation over to your host for today's call, Mr. John Duncan. Sir, you may proceed. Thanks, Matt. And I was still having a little bit of trouble hearing you there. Uh, hopefully everyone else can hear me okay. I've heard uh, from our conference coordinator that there are a couple of connections that are experiencing problems on the WebEx side of things. If you are having any problems, please uh, dial star one or send a chat to me, the host, and I'll uh, try and give you assistance in any way that I can. But welcome, everyone, to today's cyber seminar. We're happy to have Brent Newman from Los Alamos National Lab with us today. Uh, to talk about eco-hydrology of arid and semi-arid environments. As you know by now, I assume this is the third semester of these education and outreach cyber seminars that Quasi is sponsoring. If you have any problems today, as I, as I mentioned before, please, in that chat box, send a, a message to myself or to everyone else, and we'll try and uh, assist you in any way that we can. And uh, if you do have any feedback about today's presentation, any difficulties you may have had from the technical end of things, please also let me know, and that can be done after the seminar ends by emailing me at commanager at coazi.org. If for whatever reason you are experiencing a lot of problems on the WebEx end of things, um, you can go to our website, www.coazi.org, and download Brent's presentation. The next in this series is next Tuesday, um, by Dr. Krajewski at University of Iowa. His talk will be on the validation of hydrologic remote sensing. There's also a presentation next Thursday by Dave Diwali at Penn State on bridging scales and processes. Um, after that, we have a presentation by Bill Johnson of the University of Utah and a change in schedule. Mark Bain's team will not be presenting. That was originally scheduled for Wednesday the 3rd of November. That is no longer going to take place. But for a complete calendar and links to the papers and presentations and discussion forums as they exist, uh, you have our URL for that. I'd now like to introduce Brent Newman, who is a hydrogeochemist and is eco-hydrology team leader in the Earth and Environmental Science Division at Los Alamos National Laboratory. Brent has a bachelor's in geology from Central Michigan University, a master's in geology from UTEP, and a PhD in geochemistry from New Mexico Tech. Most of his work is focused on semi-arid beta zone and near-surface processes. His research was related to hydrological ecological interactions, contaminant fate and transport, and anion and stable isotope tracer methods. Brent, we're happy to have you today, and I've just made you presenter, so you should have control at this point. Okay. All right, um, we are uh, going to talk about e the eco-hydrology of arid and semi-arid uh, environments and our scientific vision. Um, <coughs> the, uh, our participants in the workshop and the authors on the paper are a, a good mix of ecologists and hydrologists, and this was a pretty uh, stimulating group to work with. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my co-authors, uh, Steve Archer, Dave Brashears, Cliff Dom, Chris Duffy, uh, Nate McDowell, Fred Phillips, Bridget Scanlon, and Emil Cox. And I'd also like to acknowledge Gary Langhorse for his help uh, in putting the presentation together. So the uh, outline of my talk is first I'll discuss why and what is arid and semi-arid eco-hydrology. Uh, we'll look at a couple of case studies. Uh, I'll discuss six scientific themes related to arid, semi-arid eco-hydrology. Uh, these themes are by no means comprehensive, but it's a pretty broad survey of some of the more important societal and scientific issues. Uh, then I'll discuss our strategy for achieving our eco-hydrology vision and then discuss uh, the expected impact. Brent, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, can you speak up just a little bit louder? Sure. Thanks. Um, what is eco-hydrology? Uh, it seeks to elucidate, A, 
influences influence the distribution, structure, function, and dynamics of ecosystems, and B, how feedbacks from biotic processes impact the water cycle. Is that better volume-wise? Yes, it is. Thanks. Uh, the references that I've shown uh, at the bottom of the slide uh, discuss the origins of hydrology, some alternative definitions, and the full citations uh, are in our paper. So why an eco-hydrological perspective? Uh, all eight of the NRC's and National Research Council's environmental grand challenges require an eco-hydrological component. Uh, and sometimes uh, in around four or five of these uh, grand challenges, uh, eco-hydrology is, is a major part of the, uh, the challenge. The NRC has also defined integrative research in the critical zone, and the definition of the critical zone is at the bottom of the slide, and it's this heterogeneous near-surface environment in which complex interactions between abiotic and biotic processes regulate natural habitat and determine the availability of life-sustaining resources. So there's clearly a pretty important driver for doing eco-hydrology when we look at this uh, definition of the critical zone. But why should we care about arid and semi-arid environments? Uh, about a third of the Earth's land surface is arid or semi-arid, uh, so it's big, and this fraction is actually per expected to increase. Uh, because of this, the uh, arid and semi-arid systems will increasingly impact human society, biogeochemical functioning, uh, land surface atmosphere interactions, even in areas that are far removed from arid or semi-arid landscapes. Uh, these regions contain some of the fastest growing urban and ex-urban centers in the world, and because of this, uh, they are currently and in the future will be suffering from chronic and acute natural resource management problems. Uh, the other thing that's interesting about arid semi-arid systems is they contain many sensitive ecotones. Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, uh, ecotones are just ecosystem boundaries. And in semi-arid systems especially, uh, these have been recognized as being among the most sensitive uh, terrestrial ecotone systems uh, on Earth. And um, this is a result of the wide elevation, precipitation, and topographic gradients that occur in arid and semi-arid systems. Um, there are lots of basically uh, uh, re borders between different ecosystems, lots of sensitive ecotones, and potential for catastrophic and dramatic change is pretty high. And we'll discuss a few examples of that uh, in a minute. A uh, couple of graphics here. Let me get the pointer on. The uh, <clears throat> this first uh, graphic shows a uh, year and uh, percent of current population, uh, and so it's showing the dramatic population growth that's occurring and expected in uh, semi-arid arid sit areas in the U.S. So the brown dashed line here is the national average. The yellow line is California. Uh, then we have Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, Arizona, and Nevada. And so you can see these five states are experiencing and will experience tremendous population growth. And these are in environments that are, are water and nutrient limited, so this will increasingly impact resources and ecosystems. On top of that, we have to deal with things like drought. And these, this is a, uh, a couple of photos uh, from of Lake Powell from June of 2000 and May of 2002 uh, showing the dramatic effects of the current drought. And we'll discuss this a little more uh, in the future or in a few minutes. So our first case study, and these case studies is, are designed just to give uh, you a flavor of some of the issues that are, are going on in arid and semi-arid uh, ecosystems. Um, is the first case study is regional scale drought induced mortality of trees. So changes in plant abundance, for instance trees, has a wide range of ecological, hydrological, and societal implications. The uh, current drought, which started in about 1999, has caused large scale 
mortality. Uh, pinion juniper woodlands are very widespread in the west, and the drought has, has impacted these woodland systems in a, in a very major way. It's also impacted other types of trees and forests, uh, but pinion junipers have really gotten hammered uh, over the last few years. For example, uh, the pinion mortality uh, has exceeded more than 98% in some locations in New Mexico. The uh, top photo here shows uh, some uh, dead pinions. The green trees are actually juniper that are a little more resistant to drought and uh, bark beetle. Uh, the bottom slide really shows uh, how big uh, this uh, tree mortality issue is. I mean, it's, it's a regional uh, in scope problem. You can see all the brown and gray are dead pinions. The green are mostly juniper. So this is a, a really huge shift in uh, a semi-arid ecosystem. Another example is the uh, drought from the 1950s. So this is work from uh, Craig Allen and Dave Brashears. Uh, the um, <coughs> 50s drought uh, shifted the ponderosa pine pinion juniper ecotone by more than two kilometers in less than five years because of tree mortality. So this is a really large scale spatial shift in less than five years. And this uh, map here uh, shows uh, what, what happened back then. The green areas are areas of ponderosa pine forest, and the yellow areas are areas of pinion juniper woodland, and the red areas indicate uh, regions or, uh, where the, uh, it was originally ponderosa pine uh, that has since shifted to uh, pinion juniper woodland. And you'll notice the scale bar is, is a kilometer here. So these are big, rapid changes uh, that can occur in these kinds of semi-arid environments. There's also a hydrological connection uh, to this problem in that uh, because of overgrazing death of the uh, ponderosa pine, there was a loss of the uh, herbaceous cover uh, in, in a particular watershed at Bandelier National Monument, and uh, this has resulted in a persistent state of extremely high runoff and erosion. Uh, it, it's quite a, a dramatic and, and catastrophic change in this particular watershed. So there is an important connection between the vegetation and hydrologic processes. So we have some questions and scientific challenges related to tree mortality. Uh, the first is, what is the critical level of plant available water that triggers tree mortality? We really don't understand very well about how trees die, but they clearly have a major effect. Uh, tree mortality has a major effect on what we see in our ecosystems and even uh, in our hydrologic systems. Uh, will current changes in woody plant abundance trigger changes in recharge or surface runoff and erosion? The uh, Bandelier example from the 50s drought clearly shows that, that we can see some pretty major changes in hydrology. Uh, will climatic variability and change influence woody cover dynamics? And we think that research that's confined either to the realm of ecology or hydrology is not going to be able to adequately address these kinds of questions, and this highlights the importance of doing interdisciplinary research. The second case study is uh, on invasion of non-native vegetation along riparian corridors. Um, arid and semi-arid riparian corridors represent a distinct ecotone, and the water budgets of semi-arid and arid basins are strongly influenced by riparian vegetation. And the character of these ecotones uh, can be impacted in a big way by non-native invasive species. A couple of the more important uh, plant, non-native plants in riparian corridors in the southwestern U.S. are salt cedar and uh, um, Russian olive. And you can see in this top photo um, what salt cedar looks like if you're not familiar, and then you can see uh, salt cedar on a, in a riparian corridor 
um, along uh, a river. So salt cedar has colonized about a million hectares in the in the western U.S. and Russian olive is widely distributed throughout 17 states, uh, reaching densities exceeding a thousand trees per hectare. So one of the things that's uh, um, kind of interesting about these non-native species, and you can really see it in this uh, picture of the uh, uh, riparian corridor along the Rio Grande and the salt cedar here, is that they tend to grow in these very dense uh, monocultures. So this has some significant implications for biological diversity, but we also wonder how these kinds of changes will affect things like stream flow and groundwater recharge. And the, uh, this process of invasion of non-native plants continuing in the western U.S. So our uh, questions and scientific challenges related to whoops, uh, um, tree morph, actually this should say repairing zone uh, plants. Uh, first, uh, how does water use by non-natives compare to that of the natives they displace? So if we uh, have displacement of, say, native cottonwoods, by salt cedar or Russian olive, how does that affect the water balance in the riparian zone? Do non-native plants alter evapotranspiration or the partitioning between evaporation and transpiration, thus influencing stream flow and groundwater? How do non-native dominated riparian communities affect fundamental ecosystem processes like primary production and nutrient cycling? And how does establishment of non-native plants alter disturbance regimes uh, such as pest outbreak or fire in ways that feed back to local hydrology? So our, our first science theme is uh, ask the question, is it important to partition evaporation and transpiration? And again, these themes are really a survey of some of the more important issues uh, in semi-arid and arid ecohydrology, but they're not at all comprehensive. So uh, looking at evaporation and transpiration, uh, we know by definition arid and semi-arid systems are water limited uh, where evapotranspiration uh, is typically uh, over 90 percent of the, of the water budget. Uh, most studies, hydrologic studies, lump plant interception, soil evaporation, and transpiration into a single term, ET. And uh, this obscures differences between biologically available water, i.e. that used for transpiration, and biologically unavailable water, uh, meaning that lost through the physical process of evaporation. So we uh, wonder that although lumping E and T is expedient and partly limited by uh, some technological issues, uh, does this lumping of E and T limit our understanding of how ecosystems and physical processes regulate the hydrologic cycle? So some of the uh, scientific issues related to evaporation and transpiration partitioning, for instance, uh, will the ratio of evaporation to transpiration increase dramatically in response to, say, extensive tree mortality or vegetation management on riparian corridors. A related question is, will the E to T ratio uh, change because we've reduced biomass since we've lowered transpiration or because we've changed the near ground energy distribution and the evaporation rate has increased? So this leads to the question of to what extent are evaporation and transpiration compensating? How do they vary temporally and spatially in patchy, arid, and semi-arid landscapes? Uh, I'm not going to show the data, uh, but it's pretty clear that there are spatial differences, uh, for instance, in intercanopy areas and canopy areas in terms of in pinyon juniper woodlands in terms of the distribution of evaporation and transpiration. So we think that there, this lack of experiments and modeling really prevents robust generalization and prediction about 
uh, evaporation and transpiration is among sites uh, through time and in response to land management or changes in land management. Our second theme involves looking at asking the question, what is the value of studying water and nutrient interactions? Uh, water has typically been regarded as the limiting resource in arid and semi-arid ecosystems. Uh, is this really true? Cooper and Johnson uh, tested the relative importance of water and nutrients, in this case nitrogen limitation, in a series of experiments in arid through subhumid locations, and they found uh, no strong evidence of a shift from water to nutrient limitation across a wide arid to subhumid gradient. For instance, even in the uh, very dry conditions uh, of some of the sites they looked at, uh, plant biomass would respond in a positive way to nitrogen additions. So their results and, and other studies suggest a strong nitrogen control and perhaps even a co-dominant control of nitrogen and water uh, in, in arid and semi-arid environments. So it seems clear that, that nutrients and water are inextricably linked. Uh, for example, nutrient availability can limit vegetation responses to precipitation and soil moisture, and then in turn, soil moisture drives nitrogen fixation and also mineralization of soil organic matter. Uh, another example of the importance of coupled water nutrient uh, interactions is uh, nitrogen inventories in arid and semi-arid beta cells. Uh, in many arid and semi-arid locations, the thick beta cells have acted as a sink for nitrate for many thousands of years. So you can see in these plots for the Mojave and Los Alamos, uh, where we're looking at depth, this is actually in meters, and chloride, uh, concentrations in blue and nitrate in green, you can see, that, for instance, in this Mojave profile, pore water concentrations in the beta zone exceed 3,000 milligrams per liter. And even in a wetter site like Los Alamos, we still have nitrate accumulation. Notice there's a big scale change here. If we look at the inventories uh, across warm deserts and shrublands, uh, these nitrate inventories can potentially increase uh, the total nitrogen inventories, uh, the, sorry, the subsurface nitrogen inventories uh, can in increase the total inventories by 14 to 71 percent and 3 to 16 percent globally. Now I should say that there are a lot of uncertainties regarding these numbers, but there's no doubt that, that across large arid and semi-arid areas, uh, and in, in these Vado zones that there's been a tremendous amount of nitrogen accumulation in the Vado zone, despite the fact that, that the ecosystems in these areas are nitrogen limited. Uh, there's also a, uh, an issue about groundwater quality if these big inventories of nitrate are flushed to groundwater as a result of, say, a wetter climate or a change in land use such as widespread uh, irrigated agriculture. So some uh, questions and challenges related to water and nutrient interactions. Uh, first, uh, an example, uh, in the northern hemisphere, uh, ecosystems are receiving about four times that of pre-industrial, in a nitrogen-limited uh, arid or semi-arid ecosystems, uh, how, how are these systems going to respond to this addition of extra nitrate. Uh, how do large data zone nitrate inventories develop in ecosystems that have strong nitrogen limitations? And are there hydrologic processes that limit more efficient utilization of nitrogen in the soil zone? Uh, we really don't know this at this time. And finally, more of a summary question, to what extent has our focus on water rather than or in isolation from nutrients constrained our understanding and uh, management of arid and semi-arid ecosystems and even hydrology. Our third science theme is uh, how do plants affect stream flow? 
Uh, vegetation plays a critical role in determining the temporal and spatial variations in soil moisture and runoff within hill slopes and within channel networks. So there's a tight coupling between vegetation and water, and this can lead to the reasonable assumption that water supply in arid and semi-arid zones may be augmented through vegetation management. For instance, if we look at these juniper monocultures in Texas, which were once uh, grasslands, if we remove the juniper, will we see increases in, say, base flow in the streams that these uplands feed into? Uh, so this issue of vegetation control to increase stream flow is a major economic and natural resource issue. Uh, approximately $40 million has been allocated in Texas for shrub control to increase stream flow, salt feeder control with the goal of, being, of increasing water availability. So these are, these are big dollars. However, there is un, there's considerable uncertainty as to the magnitude and feasibility of increasing water yield through ve vegetation management on a large scale. Well, why is this? First of all, uh, evapor evaporation and transpiration are huge. So therefore, it may not matter that you have uh, a grassland as opposed to, say, a juniper monoculture or that you removed all the pinions and junipers. Um, the other issue is that runoff in arid and semi-arid systems is episodic and largely Hortonian or infiltration excess over land flow. So you might increase peak flows, but it might not help at all in terms of increasing base flow. So there are big questions about where vegetation control uh, is most appropriately applied. There may be areas where it makes sense, uh, but there may be a lot of areas where it doesn't help in terms of uh, water supplies or stream flow at all. Our next uh, theme is related uh, to uh, plants and stream flow, and that is how do the plants affect groundwater recharge. So a <clears throat> couple of studies that I'll uh, discuss briefly. Uh, the differences in recharge between non-vegetated and vegetated lysimeters in the western U.S. Uh, show that plants can substan substantially influence groundwater recharge. On another study, uh, the, uh, in Australia, the large-scale conversion of eucalyptus woodlands to agriculture and pasture has resulted in an increase in recharge rates by two orders of magnitude. So clearly, an arid semi-arid plays a major role in controlling uh, recharge, and even and changes in vegetation can also affect how much recharge re we receive. A uh, couple more studies. Uh, the Pleistocene to Holocene shift from mesic or wetter type to xeric or drier vegetation has changed southwestern interfluvial areas from recharging to discharging. So yes, there was a very large climate change that occurred uh, during the Pleistocene-Holocene transition, but these studies are showing quite convincingly that plants are a major reason why we're not seeing uh, recharge over much of the landscape in arid and semi-arid systems. Uh, Fred Phillips has done a, did a related study using chloride mass balance uh, and looked at uh, regional chloride profiles and showed there's been little to no recharge over much of the southwest since the Pleistocene. So this is an example of a chloride profile. It's one of the uh, really useful tool in arid semi-arid systems for looking at uh, processes occurring in the Beto zone, and it's commonly called the chloride mass balance method. Uh, this is a profile from Los Alamos where we're looking at depth and poor water chloride concentrations of over 4,000 milligrams per liter, and uh, this amount of chloride represents the Beto zone residence time of about 10,000 years. So at, at this particular location, these data suggest there's been basically no recharge uh, for that time frame. So the point of all of this is that in arid, semi-arid systems, uh, much of the landscape uh, doesn't receive any recharge at all. 
So, uh, but uh, the other point I wanted to make about that was that vegetation is the main reason for this lack of recharge. Uh, we can also use vegetation types and characteristics as a way of identifying recharge areas. So this is work, uh, recent work by Michelle Walbert and Fred Phillips. And so we can use, we think we can use vegetation to identify the areas where uh, uh, recharge occurs and where it doesn't. And if we couple this to remote sense data and GIS, we might be able to get better estimates of basin scale recharge and also identify optimal areas for vegetation management. Uh, uh, and what I mean here is can we identify areas where if we do vegetation removal or conversion, uh, will it enhance recharge? So in order to try and get a better handle on uh, the issues between vegetation and recharge, we really need to do some better integration of climatic variables, vegetation characteristics, and hydrologic information. If we can do this, we can better identify where we get recharge and where we don't, and we can also mechanistically understand uh, how, what, for instance, uh, the kind of climatic forcing is needed to produce episodic recharge for a given vegetation state or a given vegetation type. Our fifth theme is uh, involves how climate, water, and landscape components interact. So uh, environmental change will stimulate feedbacks that will cause the characteristics of drainage basins to change or evolve. For instance, vegetation type, uh, soils, water tables, etc. But our current ability to forecast these kinds of changes and understand feedbacks and responses is unproven. But we think we have a way around this problem, and that is to build and use models to simulate past events during which major responses have been documented. In other words, uh, we can build models, test them against the paleo archive, and that way have better and more robust models for making forward uh, predictions of environmental change scenarios. So we think we need a paleo perspective, and uh, there are some real advantages of using, looking at this in a semi-arid or arid uh, environment. And the reason is, is that uh, these uh, types of environments contain unusually long and complete records of past environmental change. For example, uh, we can use tree rings, pack rat middens, uh, scleothems, aquifers, thick vado zones, and lacustrine sediments to build integrated records of basin scale feedback and response. So this is a photo of a pack rat midden here and Fred Phillips. Uh, this is his pet pack rat midden. I think his name is uh, Gerald. Um, anyway, uh, seriously, these uh, middens are just fantastic records uh, that uh, record uh, long time scale, tens of thousands of years, changes in vegetation and ecosystems. So the, all of these tools together uh, can really help us build uh, these integrated uh, paleoecological, hydrological records. So paleoenvironmental studies can be synthesized to construct a comprehensive accounting of the hydrology, vegetation, climate, and geo geomorphic, geomorphic history. Then this model can be driven using climate records. And then the model, model basin responses can be compared to the paleo record. And through an iterative approach, we can refine the models to reflect the actual processes and outcomes. So this would help us have more rigorous models to do better, a better job at forecasting uh, environmental impacts uh, in the future, and it will also give us a uh, way of, of obtaining some better mechanistic insights on feedback and responses. So paleo reconstruction of precipitation records uh, from tree ring and the other uh, tools I mentioned uh, could go a long way uh, to achieving uh, a, a better models and better forecasts of environmental change. 
modern perspective, and I'll just give one uh, brief example. Uh, in the mid-20th century in southwestern Australia, there was uh, an important change, uh, reduction in rainfall and increase in temperature. Uh, this change was first interpreted as being caused by a reorganization of atmospheric circulation and uh, enhanced greenhouse effects. However, Pittman looked at this and argued that these, these changes in precipitation and temperature were driven by a change in veg vegetation, uh, deforestation, uh, increased uh, agricultural area, and that this explains the observed shift in temperature and precipitation through feedback to the atmosphere. So the question is, is it the atmosphere that drove the changes in the atmospheric system that drove the change, or did the changes occur because of these vegetation changes that fed back to the atmosphere? So we think we need a, a, a collective or a more integrated new way of looking uh, at the science of change. Our last theme is how does vegetation respond to hydrological change? Uh, vegetation spatial patterns exhibit uh, self-organization and are optimally related to climate and to landscape characteristics. So, for example, on this photo from the Savietta, you can see that the south-facing hill slope is creosote bush, the north-facing hill slope is juniper. So this, in this catchment, the ecosystem is organized itself in terms of distribution and plant functional types to be uh, to optimally um, exploit the water and nutrients in the system. A related issue or example is that the seasonality of precipitation has big impacts on vegetation life forms, diversity, uh, uh, and other things uh, in arid and semi-arid ecosystems. So if we change, say, seasonality somehow, uh, we have a good reason to think that this is going to affect uh, vegetation distribution, the vegetation types uh, in the environment. So we'd like to be able to predict uh, what those changes might be. So we need to use uh, models based on first principles of plant uh, carbon water balance. And there's a lot of work going on in this area trying to understand uh, vegetation response to hydrologic changes. However, uh, the data to support this kind of modeling is really sparse. And, the mo and many of the models do not yet capture important vegetation water dynamics. We think there's a strong need for nested scale field experiments coupled with remote sensing to test and build models and improve our forecasts of vegetation response to change. We think that the uh, quasi-observatory framework is a good way to do this. However, these experiments should explicitly address modeling needs from the experimental design phase through uh, data collection. So our strategy for achieving our uh, eco-hydrology vision is this. It's actually a pretty simple one. At a high level, it's to develop a framework wherein ecologists and hydrologists proactively collaborate on complex environmental problems. This really hasn't been done before. We think this will pr promote synergistic growth and development of new perspectives. Uh, it might reveal more novel or innovative of solving uh, than, we're, than we have right now. And we think that marrying of the two disciplines has not yet been done on any significant scale. Uh, thus, the full benefit of this kind of interdisciplinary research is unrealized. So we believe that at least one of the quasi-hydrologic observatories should have an explicit focus on eco-hydrology. Probably all of the hy hydrologic observatories will have some focus on eco-hydrology, but we think at least one should have it as one of their main goals. Um, we think that an arid or semi-arid observatory would be an excellent place to do this, partly because of the high sensitivity of eco-hydrological processes to change, and hopefully uh, I've demonstrated that to you with the example today. And also, an uh, arid or semi-arid observatory would be an important 
dry and member for comparisons to observatories in subhumid or humid zones. This kind of an observatory would also provide an infrastructure where ecologists and hydrologists could collaborate directly uh, from the experimental design phase through interpretation and modeling. And it would enable training of a new generation of scientists with essential cross-disciplinary experience. So this is important to handle these complex uh, environmental problems that we have currently and those that might crop up in the future. Uh, expected impacts, uh, the ability, first a, a summary of Clark et al. Uh, the ability of scientists to forecast environmental change will affect the choices societies make and how they adapt and function in a future of great and potentially rapid change. So therefore, um, our vision includes uh, providing a rigorous scientific basis for en environmental management. Uh, we need to be able to build a better scientific basis for doing environmental forecasting. We think that successful implementation of our vision will have broad social and economic impacts and it, it, it addresses serious issues related to things like water supply and quality, ecosystem health and diversity, and the goal of becoming better stewards of sensitive, arid, and semi-arid environments. And that's the end of my talk. Well, Brent, thank you very much. That was uh, an enjoyable presentation. At this point, I'd like to open it up for questions. That can be done by hitting star one on your phone or by typing a chat in the chat box. And ladies and gentlemen, if you wish to ask a question, please press star one on your touchstone telephone. If your question has been answered or you wish to withdraw your question, press star two. Questions will be taken in the order which they are received. You may now press star one to begin. So, Brent, I guess I'll go first. In uh, having some background in reading your paper and, and talking with some folks about this, um, it's a fairly ambitious goal, but I think you, this is uh, specific enough that it's tractable. What types of data do you think would be the most important, um, would be the highest priority that aren't there yet to be able to start addressing some of these questions that you've posed? Um, I, I'm going to repeat the question for the folks here. Um, the uh, the question was, um, what kind of data do you think would be most important uh, to doing uh, to achieving the scientific vision in eco hydrology? Uh, there's a, a couple of things. Uh, one was these uh, nested experiments that I mentioned, where you have um, essentially a high resolution spatial grid with high frequency sampling at small scales. And um, and then you branch out uh, with um, uh, less uh, uh, resolution, uh, say going from hill slopes to catchments to watersheds, and that this the spatial distribution of sampling would tie to the grid spacings and models, and also uh, basically the resolution of remotely sensed data. Uh, the other thing that we've talked about a lot is the fact that we we need to be able to collect hydrologic data uh, at the same time that we're monitoring, say, plant water use. Um, <clears throat> so we need uh, basically more innovative experiments and better technologies to simultaneously measure what the plants are doing and what uh, is happening in the ecosystems. And, and this holds true, for example, for nitrate uh, nutrient monitoring as well. Okay, thanks. Um, do you have your chat box? Can you see that there? I'm not sure if you went to the full screen. Or yep. But there's a question from Utah State University. Okay, how, how does water storage capacity of the soil profile uh, impact considerations of eco-hydrology? Um, <clears throat> the water storage capacity, and in fact, you know, most of the major uh, hydrologic uh, parameters or characteristics that we look at uh, have a huge impact on eco-hydrology. Um, for instance, uh, uh, high uh, <coughs> uh, clay content soils uh, have different uh, major potential water uh, uh, 
uh, moisture characteristic curve relations, uh, and this is uh, important in terms of retention of water and root uptake because the plants essentially have to overcome the uh, you know the matrix potential of the soil to get water. So these kinds of things are are all really critical uh, in terms of how plants obtain water, but they also affect uh, the distribution of water in the soil zone and the distribution of nutrients in the soil zone as well. And in dry environments, uh, you know, being able to have soils that retain water can be a, a, a real beneficial thing for certain kinds of plants. Uh, the second question that just popped up is what about the role of animals, uh, insects, herbivores, and microbial processes? Um, <clears throat> Well, this, this is a huge thing. Uh, I didn't mention it, uh, but uh, and th I think this happens in humid as well as arid, semi-arid. But um, animals can have a huge impact on the uh, hydrology of these systems through the development of macropores. And we've seen lots of examples, even here at Los Alamos, where gophers uh, can significantly impact the near-surface hydrology by burrowing. Um, ants and other insects can do the same kinds of things. Um, microbial processes are are really uh, key, especially in, in the realm of understanding what's going on with nutrients uh, and uh, turnover of organic carbon and all the kinds of uh, transformations that things like nitrate go through. So there's there's clearly a a, a need to integrate bio geochemical processes. Uh, in, in these kinds of, as part of the uh, hydrological observatory research program. Questions in the queue, Matt? Okay, that's the time, so there are no questions in the queue. Uh, I'll ask if anybody here has any questions. Oh, okay. I guess last call for questions. If anything else does arise, there will be a discussion forum uh, for this cyber seminar posted to the Quasi website shortly. There's some problems today and it wasn't uh, functioning correctly, but that will be there soon. So if you do think of any questions after we hang out today for Brent, um, feel free to post them there. There's one that just came through from Penn State. Uh, the question is, uh, <clears throat> with soil profile morphology and soil distribution over the landscape reflect uh, nitrogen chloride profile in the paleo environment uh, you mentioned. Um, not sure I quite understand the question, but... Um, if Penn State would like to jump online to, to clarify this question, start one. Okay. And so your question comes from the line of, can we win? So you may proceed with your question. Okay, how do I proceed with that? Just start zero? No, you're, Henry, you're, uh, you're talking. How are you? Okay, um, all right. Um, my question uh, is basically related to um, uh, some of the things that we could observe up in situ uh, with soil profile, like different layers, like um, different uh, um, uh, morphological information that could reflect uh, organic matter content, soil structure, that's uh -huh. vertical orientation. But beyond the point, uh, still, then when you look at a landscape, uh, then there are different types of soils that um, may or may not reflect uh, uh, vegetation or, or water, uh, moisture condition, things like that. Right. I'm just curious about what may be your view on that perspective. Okay. Um, I see what you mean. The uh, I think the important point of uh, what we're trying to get across here is that um, Things like soil distribution, uh, the vegetation, the water content, the structures of soils that we see um, are functions of uh, both what's happening hydrologically but also vegetation and climate. And so uh, part of the modeling discussion that I mentioned is um, that, you know, if we can integrate these, these kinds of fields, uh, we have a better uh, potential for understanding why we see a particular, say, soil distribution uh, at the landscape scale or why we see uh, distributions of nitrate that vary with depth or across a landscape. 
the uh, the next uh, question was, have you considered the role of soil biotrust in nitrogen production? And uh, <coughs> the uh, answer is, uh, crusts are really important, and I actually, we took a couple photos of, of crusts uh, because they're so important in uh, arid, semi-arid systems, but they, they just didn't make the talk. Um, but uh, soil biocrusts are, are really critical, things like cryptogams, in terms of controlling the nutrient distributions and the transformations that nutrients have in the environment. And they're also uh, pretty important in controlling uh, runoff generation as well. So, um, again, this is uh, definitely a, an important thing. Matt, are there any other questions in the queue? Uh, no, sir, there are no further questions. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, you may have Okay, we've just got a couple minutes by my clock before uh, the hour is up, uh, and we are trying to end on time so that people can get out of rooms that they need to get out of. But Brent, I'd really like to take this opportunity and thank you again, uh, as well as your team, for the effort that went into this. Sure, thank, thank you. Um, last chance for questions, anybody? Last chance for questions. Okay. Well, thanks for everyone's uh, participation today. The next installment of this cyber seminar series will be on Tuesday of next week. The topic there is validation of hydrologic remote sensing. Thanks, everybody.